Hello and welcome. Welcome to this online service of worship for Sunday, August 23rd, 2020, brought to you by the Congregation of Crossroads United Church in Kingston, Ontario. My name is the Reverend Judith Evenden, and as the minister for this congregation, I'm delighted to welcome you, to thank you for joining us from wherever you are and whenever you are choosing to tune in. Joining me in worship leadership today are our music directors, Kevin Guthrie and Shirley Porter. And our vocal soloist today is Crossroads Choir member, Dan Norman. Norman Rice is behind the camera in our church hall filming the segments that are recorded there. And Alan Bear has returned to weave our worship together into this video that you are watching. Their gifts of time and talent combined with your financial support have enabled the ministries of Crossroads United to continue during this time of pandemic. This includes our food voucher program, which provides 25 grocery cards to folks who come to our church, albeit outside the building, on the third Wednesday of each month. If you'd like to support this ministry in particular, please designate part of your gift to the Crossroads Benevolent Fund. If you'd like to contribute, there are many ways to do so. You could mail us a check. You could make a donation using the Canada Helps logo on our website, or you can make an e-transfer. The directions for that are also on our website. And if you're not sure how to do any of that, just contact the office and we'd be glad to help you out. As part of our ongoing work as a church, we are on a journey of reconciliation with the First Nations peoples of this land. The United Church has been working hard for over 30 years to heal the relationships broken by the Indian Act and the Residential Schools Program. And so as we begin each worship service and our meetings, we want to take time to acknowledge the land where we live and work and play. Acknowledge the stewardship and the hospitality of the First Nations peoples when settlers came to these lands. For the Crossroad Congregation, we acknowledge that our building resides on lands that includes the hereditary people of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe First Nations. And where I live and currently work on Kashwakamak Lake and North Frontenac Township, I acknowledge the unceded territory of the Algonquin First Nations. I invite you to now acknowledge the land where you are today. We also take time in the beginning of our service to, to light a candle, to symbolize the presence of God who's always with us, but a candle that holds us fast as we worship together. As I light my candle, I invite you to light one where you are. This candle dances with the presence of the Spirit, reminding us of the warmth of community in which God calls us to gather, and the light that shines with wisdom, insight, and clarity for our time of worship. As we gather now, I invite you to join with Dan as we sing together from our More Voices hymn book, number 18. God, prepare me to be a sanctuary.
God's children are welcome and wanted here no matter your need. May you find rest from your weariness, comfort from your pain, balm for your soul, a food for your mind, and hope for tomorrow. God's ability to tend and nurture, calm and inspire, knows no bounds and never ends. Let us open our hearts and minds to God's loving kindness and welcome, and let us be God's loving kindness and welcome for each other as we worship together. Let us pray. The summer has flown by. The days are already shorter, the nights cooler. In this last week of August, we pray to you, God, help us continue to notice the beauty all around us. As our calendars fill up and the summer holiday life comes to a close, help us to schedule time for you in our busy lives. When we are able, help us to offer a smile, a, a virtual hug, a meal, or a ride to those of us who are struggling. As the teachers, students, and parents prepare to face the back, the back to school season with all that is unknown, bless them with courage, patience, and wisdom. We pray for all among us who, especially at this time of year, are challenged by illness, loneliness, or uncertain times. We offer these and all of our silent prayers to you as we join together in the sacred prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, praying to you who are our mother and our father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's join together again with Dan as we sing How Clear Is Our Vocation, Lord. And that is in your more voices, or sorry, your Voices United hymn book at 500 and four.
I offer just one scripture reading for us today, reading from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we are, who are many, one body in Christ. And individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, to the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. May we hear in these words from our scripture, Spirit speaking to us in new and empowering ways this day. Amen. Dan now offers a solo for us. I will sing a new song, music by Anthony Dvorak, and words based on Psalm 145, and 144. My sermon title this week is Holy Bodies. In Romans chapter 12, we read, 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Whenever I read or hear this passage from Romans, I have a flashback. In my mind, I am sitting in the sanctuary of Chalmers United Church in Kingston. It is 1987. My fellow classmates and I are awaiting the moment when we will be called forward to receive our test tamer and our Master of Divinity degree from Queen's Theological College and Queen's University. This presentation marks the final academic step towards ordination. But it isn't about receiving those documents that I recall most about that day. Not surprising to many of you, it was rather the anthem sung by the Chambers Choir under the direction of David Cameron. After the Romans passage was read, and probably some other gospel reading that I don't recall, this choir, who had been my musical family since 1978, stood and sang the beautiful words and music of Canadian church musician Healy Willand, Behold the Tabernacle of God. It was a moment I will never forget. With words that may sound a bit archaic to us, Willen's lyrics and music are a hauntingly beautiful setting which inspired this listener at least to ponder what it means to be a holy vessel for God. That this body, my body, is the place wherein God resides. It is a humbling notion. One that gives me pause every time I read from Romans 12, hear or sing Willen's anthem. Before I share his lyrics, I want to say for the purpose of this sermon, I've made the text inclusive. And I wish also to say that the word dreadful in this context should really be heard as awesome or magnificent. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with humankind, and the Spirit of God dwelleth within you, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? For the love of God we do this day celebrate the joys of the temple with a sense of festivity. Oh, how dreadful is this place. This is the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. As my friends from that choir, some of whom were close friends, sang these words to us, I recall swallowing hard at that notion that my body was a holy vessel, a tabernacle for God. This was the first time that I had considered the possibility that my call to ministry was asking me to be a vessel for God. It was a humbling and scary moment. It still gives me pause to think that each week I am asked through this act of preaching to strive to be a vessel for God's Spirit to speak. As I thought about that experience this week, I started pondering what the world would be like if each person understood themselves to be a tabernacle, a container for the divine, and saw each other in the same way. What would it mean for our everyday transactions with strangers, family, and friends if we truly engaged with each other with a sense of being the presence of the divine, of holiness? It is perhaps easy enough to imagine to do this with family and friends most of the time. But when we tried to imagine seeing the divine spark in the one who just cut us off, jumped the line in the already too full grocery store, let their off-leash dog run all over our property, walked in a public space without a mask, it is a little too much to grasp. You know what I'm saying. In inviting to see ourselves and others as holy, as acceptable, as holders of the divine, Paul also gives us metaphorically the means to understand how that can be true of people who are so diverse. 
He uses the image of a body with many parts, an image he also uses in 1 Corinthians 12. He writes, For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy and proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. In other words, not only are we each other's vessels for God, together we are part of a large body who are called to work together in harmony respecting the gifts that each of us has been given. In doing my preparations this week, I came across these words from Reverend Susan Ivany, a fellow United Church minister serving currently in Thunder Bay. She offers these words as part of the opening reflections on this passage from Romans for a preaching resource called Midrash. Although this was 15 years ago, I think her words are still relevant and helpful. Susan wrote, Paul represents a somewhat utopian vision of what community can look like for the body of Christ. I want desperately to believe that Paul's vision is actually possible. I want to believe in a community where individuals' gifts and skills are accepted as offerings of faith and not as a means to score accolades or to gain control over the church's operation. I want to believe in a church where bullies cannot silence the gifts of those unwilling to take them on. I want to believe in a community where more than a handful of people do all of the real work of keeping the place afloat. I've come to believe that the institution we know as church comes with a set of dynamics bigger than all of us. Churches are like a huge glass beakers into which a bunch of good people of faith are poured the beaker is mixed and a chemical reaction happens that can either simmer gently or explode out the top. The nature of that reaction is dependent on many factors, but there will always be a reaction because we're dealing with real people with real issues of their own. Our task is to transform our complicated communities into healthy, life-giving incarnations of the body of Christ." End quote. Like Susan, I too believe that this is our task, and I also believe that it is possible for us to transform, not just as congregants transforming churches into life-giving incarnations of Christ, but also as citizens transforming the world into healthy, life-giving incarnations of the divine creator of us all. And it begins, I think, with seeing that divineness in each other. It starts the moment we stop seeing the other in each other. It starts whenever we recall who we are and whose we are, that we are all children of the same Creator. For reasons that I am sure a psychiatrist would love to analyze, I stayed up too late for four nights this week watching the Democratic Convention in the United States. After four years of almost, sorry, after almost four years of unimaginable leadership, I needed to hear something hopeful. I needed to know for our family who live in that country, live with the fear of a pandemic out of control and a national identity that has been shredded into pieces, there might be change in the near future. While there were many words, stories, and speeches that spoke of hope, of empathy, of passion, and of praise, there were also words of negativity and blame. There is no doubt they are striving to go high, but they are working within a system that by its very nature sets people up against each other. No matter how pretty you try to make it, each one's claiming to be right, each one is claiming to be the best to lead that country. We need to find a third way. We keep using the same system, a broken system, to put this fractured world right. 
and it isn't working. We don't see each other as sparks of the divine, let alone as being vessels of that spirit of God. Perhaps what we can say about this time in the history of our siblings to the south is that this is a critical moment for them and all of us to make a major shift away from hate towards justice, kindness, compassion, and empathy. This is what is at the heart of the Christian message, and it is also in the heart of the messages of other faith traditions as well. We are all God's children. There is no easy path ahead for any of us. This pandemic has turned the world on its head. There's no going back, and we don't know yet what lies ahead. There has never been a more important moment for all of us to pause, to catch our collective breath, take in what is truly happening around us, and look for opportunities as a collective, as the body of humanity, to create a better world for us all. A few weeks ago, I began a four-week online course run by the Faith and Lead program at Luther Seminary. These are the same folks that provide the Festival of Homiletics, which I participated in this spring. To be perfectly honest, I was drawn to take this course because of the title, How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You Are Going. Our instructors, uh, instructor Susan Beaumont wrote a book with the same title. Now, strangely enough, it came out last fall, long before the pandemic was even on the horizon. With a group of almost 100 and almost 200 other clergy types, I've, I've been reading her book, listening to her lectures, doing some of the assignments, and taking part in a weekly one-hour session with her and others in the course. In those sessions, she has introduced us, well, me at least, to Irish poet, priest, and theologian John O'Donohue, a man of incredible insight into the human soul who died far too young and too soon. Just two months before his unexpected death in 2008, his book of blessings was released, titled To Bless the Space Between Us, this was the poem that Susan read to us as we began this journey together. It speaks profoundly to this time in which we find ourselves. When near the end of day, life has drained out of light, and it is too soon for the mind of night to have darkened things. No place looks like itself. Loss of outline makes everything look strangely in between, unsure of what has been or what might come. In this wane light, even trees seem groundless. In a while it will be night, but nothing here seems to believe the relief of darkness. You are in this time of the interim, where everything else seems withheld. The path you took to get here has washed out the way forward is still concealed from you. The old is not old enough to have died away. The new is still too young to be born. You cannot lay claim to anything. In this place of dusk, your eyes are blurred. There is no mirror. Everyone else has lost sight of your heart, and you can see nowhere to put your trust. You know you have to make your own way through. As far as you can, hold your confidence. Do not allow confusion to squander this call which is loosening your roots in false ground, that you might come free from all you have outgrown. What is being transfigured here is your mind, and it is difficult and slow to become new. The more faithfully you can endure here, the more refined your heart will become for your arrival in the doomed dawn. Remember that last 
part of the opening of that passage from Romans. After speaking about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, the author writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That opportunity for renewal is happening right now in the middle of this pandemic. We have the gift of this time apart to, to sit in silence, to discern what is good and acceptable and perfect, and to choose it. We have the gift of this time apart to distill down what is really important, to look at our own attitudes towards others, especially those others we have disdained in the past, and begin to transform our minds, our ways of thinking and living, so that all are viewed as tabernacles, vessels of the divine. It is a high and holy calling to live our lives in such a way. To many, we will look crazy. They will find our values, our unwillingness to condemn, askew. But if you think about it, Jesus didn't have a particularly good time of it either. So why should we expect anything different? Why would our discipleship be any easier? That shouldn't stop us, however, from trying. As I read at some point this week, the question to keep asking ourselves is not what would Jesus do, but rather what would Jesus have me do? According to Paul, we are to be transformed. We are to see ourselves and others as holy vessels. We are part of a diverse and holy body that needs everything to work in harmony for all our lives to be the rich blessings that they are meant to be. As you ponder this invitation, I offer this blessing written by John O'Donoghue. May your body be blessed. May you realize that your body is a faithful and beautiful friend of your soul. May you be peaceful and joyful and recognize that your senses are sacred thresholds. May you realize that holiness is mindful gazing, feeling, hearing, and touching. May your senses gather you and bring you home. May your senses always enable you to celebrate the universe and the mystery and possibilities in your presence here. May the Eros, the love of the earth, the divine, bless you. May it be so. Amen and amen. As we continue to ponder what those words mean for us, I invite you to sing with me now as I sing from the More Voices hymn book number 153, a song called Body, Mind, and spirit. Body, mind, and spirit, holy every trinity, joy of God creator, life lived abundantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
born to be. Sing, rejoice in light most sacred, reveal in mystery. For our prayer time this morning, I wish to offer a body prayer. I'm grateful to the Plural Guild for teaching this ancient prayer. They introduce it with these words. A 14th century Christian mystic, Julian of Norwich, once wrote, The fruit and the purpose of prayer is to be one with and like God in all things. This body prayer is a wonderful way to bring all of ourselves into the act of prayer, body, mind, and spirit. This body prayer was created by the contemplative order of Julian of Norwich. Father John Julian developed the four words to describe their silent contemplative approach to prayer. And Father Ethan Jewett developed the body positions related to the four words. The prayer has four simple postures and intentions. Await. Await God's presence however it may come to you. Allow. Allow of God's sense of God's presence to come or not and be what it is. Accept as a gift whatever comes or does not come. Accept that you do not know everything and you are not always in charge. And attend. Attend to what you are called to, willing to be present and be God's love in the world, however God calls you to. Await. Allow. Accept. And attend. Wait. Allow, accept, and attend. Amen. Let's join with our musicians in singing our closing hymn from Voices United, number 575, I'm going to live so God can use me.
may the words that we have just sung, that, that commitment to live so that God can use us, stay with us as we move back into our lives. Let us go with a caring and a daring and a tender love, remembering that life is short and we do not have much time, nor do we know how much time we have to gladden the hearts and minds of those who make this journey with us. So let's be swift to love and make haste to be kind and just in all that we say and do, knowing that the blessing of God who is within and between and beyond us all is with us this day and always. And let the people say, Amen.